you're making some really good points um, um, with regard to that, um, with regard to some of the the risks. I mean, there's you know, the concentration risk being being the big being the big one, you know, but also there's there's the geographic risk as well, um, uh, being being extremely exposed to one local area. Um, do you want to? Do I don't know if you've had a chance to uh, to, to right, play with your audio right. settings. I try. Does this make any difference, or um, is it my internet? Oh, that's, yeah, that's, that, that's much better. That's 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 much much better. Yeah. So if you, you can carry on. Sorry, I cut you off mid flow. That's all right. No, no, no. It's fine. Um, you know, like I said, CCLA. They're, they're a fund manager that our clients invest in. They're, they're very well diversified across asset types and locations. And then other fund managers, um, some of our other clients who invest in the Aviva Line Fund. That's a that's a sort of three billion size portfolio. And it's it's invested in offices, supermarkets, healthcare, leisure, student accommodation. So local authorities that are investing on their own, maybe just investing in their local area, maybe looking at one type of asset base, retail, or um, you know, they're not necessarily spreading the risk. And also, what's really important, I think, and what's interesting is that you mentioned earlier, Stephen, that you know, Spelf want to collect 95% of their rent, which is pretty good. Um, just shows you that. You know, even a diversified portfolio is at risk of non-payment and big fund managers can probably wear that because they've got cash reserves that can absorb those non-payments but can a local authority that's got a small portfolio of property that can that actually deal with a, a reduction in their rent levels yeah i suppose that's that comes to the big point isn't it that you know, we've got you know geographic risk and concentration risk but really the biggest risk is just of individual tenants not paying the rent uh, whether that's because you know, they are taking advantage of a, of a new rule or whether they just simply don't have the cash or they're trying to cord cash for other purposes or they completely default the big risk for for any investor in commercial property is that the tenants don't pay the rent um phil obviously during coronavirus we've seen unprecedented levels of support that the government has provided to to businesses and most businesses are a tenant of somebody at some some point what's the what are sort of the big headline uh, figures that have been well or headline schemes that that have provided support to tenants which may be um maybe supporting some of those high rent collection figures at the moment but that we might start to see rolled off in the future no, Stephen. Well, there is, of course, the well-publicised furlough scheme, which was put into operation a few months ago, um, and the government has made provision of business support grants to smaller businesses, um, to rate payers, uh, in terms of direct cash injection. However, none of those were directly linked to the payment of commercial rent. Instead, they pushed through a raft of legislation in March, which operated to curtail landlords' rights to take steps and action against their tenants, which has been periodically extended. In the first place, we had, under the Coronavirus Act, um, a restriction upon a landlord's right to forfeit commercial leases for non-payment of rent. And that originally was due to expire in, at the end of June, but has been extended now to the 20th of September. If you think about it, shortly before the September quarter date, uh, many tenants may well be liable to pay up to three quarters rent by that stage at a time when landlords are just about to have their rights returned to the subject of the government extending um, that moratorium uh, further. But in addition, landlords have not been able to rely upon their right to recovery of rent under the commercial rent arrears recovery process. Um, now they have to demonstrate that there's over 189 days worth of rent that is outstanding before they can bring that scheme into operation. They've also been restricted upon issuing winding up petitions in respect of non-payment of rent until the end of September this year, unless they can demonstrate that the reason that the tenant is in default is non-COVID related. And more widely, um, there's been changes to the court rules uh, whereby possession claims, many types of possession claims have been stayed. Um, initially, again, that was stays that were in place until June, which was then extended to the middle of August. And now there's a brand new rule that's about to come into, op will be coming into operation at the end of August, 
which will uh, vary to an extent the ability to bring possession claims against tenants until March 2021. So there has been significant uh, government intervention um, in the well, restricting landlords remedies um, that, that would have ordinarily been available to them in the event of tenant defaults arising out of uh, the pandemic. Yeah, it seems to me that um, perhaps this is, a, maybe I'm over-egging it, but it seems to me that the big reason we haven't seen the major defaults that you might expect with the sort of economic contraction we had is because the government has tried to put the economy on, on deep freeze. And part of that is really uh, what you've just described, all of these reductions in the rights of commercial property investors and, and the holders of commercial property. So what we may see is the furlough scheme rolls off. So companies are going to start to see an increase in, in their staffing costs or, or in redundancy costs at the same time as suddenly the rent is going to be expected to be paid in September, October, and November, as you've described. You know, it could be mm. up to three quarters of rent paid at the same time. This could be that you know autumn could really be a point where all of the losses that we've not seen in the first two quarters and all of the defaults we haven't seen suddenly appear almost, um, and we so we see a a sudden acceleration of, uh, and hopefully that won't be the case. You know, no no one wants that to be the case. But it may be that that is that we have just put somebody we've kicked the can down the road to a certain extent. Yeah. If yeah, which are, um, I mean, I suppose Phil, the first question is well, what can investors do um, to try and to try and protect themselves? What sort of you know thinking you know starting from from starting from square one, if you like, what sort of clauses should be in a commercial property lease? Uh, to ensure that an investor is protected as much as possible. Obviously, you can't uh, you can't contract yourself out of legislation, so you can't do anything about the new legislation that's come in. But what sort of clauses would you expect to be in a commercial property lease that that would protect a, a an investor more generally? Yeah, I mean, well, <laughs> what I would like to see and what exists are normally very different things. But in an ideal world. <laughs> um, what you'd want to see is uh, a well-drafted uh, forfeit provision. Um, it still surprises me uh, that the number of leases that we do see, which doesn't have either a forfeiture provision within the lease um, or has a badly drafted forfeiture provision, which uh, is subject to legislative restrictions on its operation, but in principle permits a landlord to recover its premises from a defaulting tenant. Um, that may well have more limited value uh, in, in the times that we may well be about to face in respect of uh, landlords not wanting to be left with void units, but they should at least have the ability to recover the premises from a tenant. And absent that provision, I'm afraid to say, um, you would not be able to terminate the lease and recover possession from a non-paying tenant. Um, you simply must have one. Um, also, in respect of that particular clause, I'd want it to be drafted in a way which didn't just permit recovery in the event of non-payment of rents or other breaches of the lease, but for it to be engaged in insolvency situations. Lease, teams, lease terms can, can be modified uh, by some of the processes that exist to protect companies in the event of, insol uh, in the event of insolvency but the right to forfeit for insolvency can't be modified to that extent. So it's the existence of that provision and the manner in which it's been drafted that, that will be key. Then obviously, again, it's a matter of negotiation, but in an ideal world, I'd want to see restrictions on a tenant's ability to assign its lease or to underlet to ensure that it can't simply dump premises on another failing company or transfer it into a shell company, which has got no assets worth enforcing against, or indeed simply assign it to, to a new co, which has got no, no covenant strength. A landlord really does need to be able to, to retain its ability to refuse consent to that sort of assignment or underletting where it's reasonable to do so. Um, I mean, I suppose finally, um, <laughs> if you want to tick all of the boxes, it's extremely useful to have more than one route of recovery. Uh, I'd like to see in this ideal world uh, a rent deposit deed that can be drawn against in the event of non-payment of rent. 
I'd like to have guarantors named in a lease so that rent can be pursued from them in the event of default. And where leases have been assigned, I'd also want the ability to, to pursue former tenants uh, in the event that the current tenants defaulting. But as you quite rightly say, um, you know, it, it's it's not necessarily going to be the case that those leases that are in place at present provide for all of those things um, negotiated under different circumstances. But those sorts of provisions in respect of new lettings are the main key terms that I'd like to see in any commercial letting. So really, the takeaway is having really good, clean, reliable documents, you know, not 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 just having a piece of paper saying that they'll pay the rent on a certain date it is about making sure that you've got some really strong contractual protections in place yeah where it can be negotiated uh, and indeed i mean in the case of, of leases um that have now expired where tenants are holding over um under the legislation the 54 landlord and tenant act that allows them to hold over is now the time to maybe look to uh, to renegotiate that um Yes, it, it will be useful in that regard. I suppose one point though is that um, it may well have an impact upon the rent that you can seek under any new lease. So it's a, it's a balancing act, but um, strong contractual protection is key um, rather than flimsy um, one sheet <laughs> type agreements um, of the type I have unfortunately come across. <laughs> unfortunately, I think we've all uh, come across those in our careers. Uh, Mark, to, Mark, to move to you, um, one of the things I think is coming out of this conversation quite clearly is the big risk is you know, tenant default if you are you are a commercial property investor. What sort of checks, not from a legal point of view, but from a financial point of view, should investors be look to, look to be doing? So what sort of analysis can, can investors do when signing up a, a tenant or deciding whether to you know, put a long lease uh, or put, or put a lease in place for, for a new counterparty? Yeah, I think, well, one of the key things to start is the starting point, which is that any of these transactions that local authorities are entering into, they should be con considering the MHCLG investment guidance, which was um, expanded to include investment in commercial property. Um, and that made, made sure that local authorities fully considered the markets that they were entering into via these investments. Um, considering the competition that you're exposed to and how they thought, think the market will evolve. So that's the key, the starting point. So if you haven't done that sort of analysis, then you really shouldn't be entering into commercial property transactions at all. But if you have done that, then obviously you're going to look at your tenants on a case by case bit, um, basis. And the sort of things that we recommend you do look at and the sort of things that we've undertaken for a number of our clients would be to do a full detailed piece of due diligence and that would start with a, a detailed review of their published accounts and we would probably look back at least five years and undertake a calculation of all the key financial ratios so current ratio interest recover gearing etc sort of get a feel on how the you know how the company is in terms of its balance sheet strength how it's evolved over time how it's reacted to different trading um, conditions and, and how is it set to absorb the stresses that are currently in the um, economy and we'd also do some sort of analysis where we would look at the you know similar organizations that are operating in similar markets or within a similar region and competing against that tenant because you know if, if the tenant that you're currently looking to negotiate a new new lease with is is strong relative to its competitors then that's good but if it's if it's struggling and its competitors are, are stronger then that will give you a, a warning sign that maybe they're there is a problem and a potential for a, either default on, on rent or reduction in rent. You know, and so all of the accounts should be available from the company's house. And you know, the analysis can be undertaken quite quite easily, but we can help you with that. So obviously many of these tenants will be listed companies and you can look at the share price and see what's what's been going on, what, what investors' views are of that company. And there'll be there'll be strong news stories around around tenants. If they're listed, you know there'll be there'll be um, buy sell views from analysts, and, and we'll look into that. And that gives you a view of where the market thinks people are heading, because the, the share price is a fairly good indicator of investors' views of a, of a, um, a company's strength. Maybe the company's issued debt to fund purchases in the past, and there may be credit rating information available, and that can be looked at in, in a fair, in, in a great 
the amount of detail and can give you a view of, of the credit ratings um, organisations use of, of the tenant strength. And obviously, you need to have a view of the market that that tenant is operating in. You know, there's plenty of information out there around the retail sector, for instance. And, and if you're going to buy retail or, invest, or have a, an asset which is exposed to retail, then, you know, if you're not looking at what's going on in the retail sector and, and taking the views of the, the forecasters out there that are telling you what's happening in retail, then, um, you know, really should, we, should you be buying assets that are exposed to that, that particularly risky, risky market? And ultimately, once you've done all that analysis, you want to do some sort of impact assessment, don't you? Because you want to have a look at, you know, what are what are the probability of your of your tenant either reducing their rent via a CBA or or going or sort of defaulting completely? What impact does that have on you as an organisation, as the as the owner of the property, if your tenant comes back to you and says they can only afford to pay 50% of your rent? And what's that going to do to your general fund because you've budgeted for 100% rent and you've got costs you need to meet. So we need to look at that ultimately and stress stress the asset because it's the income you've, you're you expecting to receive but it's the income which is probably the, the riskiest element of the, the whole process because that's at the gift of the, as Phil has mentioned, that's at the gift of the tenant now. It's not the landlord that necessarily influences the amount of rent, it's the tenant these days. So I think that's what you need to do and take a full detailed due diligence and assess the risks and, and look at you know what if scenarios and and determine whether or not you should be entering the lease or um or or, or the investment or, or not at all yeah i think that that those are all really good points and on top of that that's all things that though you do it at the beginning of the lease a limited amount of that you'd want to be doing on a semi-regular basis during the lease as well because you don't want any nasty surprises and though you may have done a good amount of due diligence at the beginning you want to try and make sure that on an ongoing basis you know what the performance of your big tenants are now no one expects you if you've got a little independent shop in your in your big commercial property to be uh, for you to be you know, doing huge amounts of detailed due diligence on them but if you've got big anchor tenants uh, with, who and the payment of their rent decides whether you're making uh, you know, making a profit or making a loss on the asset, those are the sorts of ones that you should be uh, you should be continuing to monitor throughout throughout you know, throughout their lease life. One thing that you said there, Mark, which I think we really should uh, come to now and, and and brings us to an interesting point is when you were talking about uh, the worst case scenario. What if you know they do go through a, a CVA or go into administration or go into insolvency. So I'll br bring us back to Phil. Phil, from a from a sort of legal perspective, if it all does go wrong and a tenant uh, you know goes 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 in the direction we don't want to uh, see, what 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 are the processes? I mean, there's there's the we tend to say, oh, if they default, as if that's as if that's just a single thing that happens the same all the time. But actually, my understanding is there's a few different processes that a tenant can go through and that they will actually have quite significantly different impacts on the uh, on the commercial landlord. So are you, are you able to sort of give us a, a brief uh, overview of what those are? I will, I will try to keep it brief. Uh, there are now <laughs> no less than five main regimes for company insolvency. Um, so yeah, I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll take, a, have to take a look at those. Um, I mean, brand new, uh, introduced only last month um, by the Corporate Insolvency and Government Act is um, something called an A1 moratorium. And this is um, a moratorium that can be applied for by the company, the tenants in difficulty, initially gives rise to a period of 20 business days, which can, by the way, be extended in principle by up to a year, during which time uh, a landlord wouldn't be able to take steps itself to force that uh, that company, that tenant that's in difficulty into insolvency for unpaid rent. It also stops the landlord from taking steps to recover, prem recover the premises from the tenant uh, or to exercise its rights under the commercial rent arrears recovery process, which is the scheme that allows a landlord to serve notice on a tenant to make payments of rent or it will attend the premises and seize its assets. And um, those things can't be done without first asking the court for permission. And um, it's designed to give a company 
breathing space really from enforcement while it tries to right its ship. Um, the good news is that during uh, that moratorium period, um, the company, the tenant that's in difficulty must pay uh, the rent that falls due. And if it doesn't, the moratorium will come to an end. Um, but I say that's, that's, that's the newest one that's been introduced. Um, folk will be more familiar with uh, administration, which is a, a different process, a process that can be started by creditors where a company is effectively restructured um, in order to salvage it. Again, that gives rise to a moratorium, which prevents a landlord from forfeiting the lease, from using craft, commercial rent arrears recovery process, from issuing proceedings, even from enforcing security it may have, such as a rent deposit, without first going to the administrator and asking for permission, good luck, uh, or instead going to uh, ask permission from the courts. And the court's likelihood to, to give a landlord permission to take any of those steps will see it embarking upon an exercise which isn't straightforward where it weighs up the interests of creditors uh, versus the landlord and trying to take a view on um, well, trying to get some sort of balance in play but it won't necessarily favour the landlord. Um, again I suppose the good news with that process is that the, um, the administrator must pay rent as an expense whilst the premises are being used for the purposes of the administration. Um, but um, you know you kind of have anachronisms where although a lease may prevent um, the tenant from assigning it to a third party without permission, the administrator will put in a third party occupier into those premises because a third party occupier is continuing the business in one form. Um, and even though that's a breach of the lease, the landlord will not be able to recover control of the premises without getting permission from the court. So its, it's rights are heavily curtailed and um, I'll, I'll just dwell briefly, if I may, on a, a type of administration, which is the, the prepack administration, which uh, became very popular during and after the last recession, where by deals are struck before a company goes into administration, um, where profitable parts of the business will be hired off and sold. Um, and that takes place immediately after the administration order is executed. So before a landlord knows what is happening, it's um, possible that um, it could be left with uh, an unprofitable void unit um, that the administrator wants to dump, or alternatively, a brand new occupier is being put into possession. And it's going to struggle in that situation to decide, well, does it try to recover possession by seeking permission from the court? Does it, in fact, want to um, strike a new arrangement with this third party occupier, which may be on less favourable terms? Again, its rights will be will be curtailed um, by the restrictions in play. Um, there are others, I'm afraid to say, um, just very quickly. Um, there's liquidation, which is the process by which a company is wound up. Uh, restrictions in that situation um, are somewhat similar to administration, um, ability to forfeit issue proceedings, use car curtailed uh, without permission of the court. Uh, rent must again be paid as part of it. Um, and you can put the liquidators to an option where they decide whether to keep hold of premises and give them back. Um, there's receivership, which I won't go into because it's not of great relevance here. Um, but uh, effectively allows a charge holder to step in and sell off securities to, to, to realise its security. Probably most onerous though at the present time is the, the company voluntary arrangement, the CBA, which, um, which Mark touched on earlier on. Now those have surged in popularity since the last recession and I think I saw that um, since 2016 their use has doubled. And you know, you'll, you'll, you'll recall Debenhams, Medicare, home base in the last few years going through this process. Um, they're particularly onerous to landlords because it allows that tenant company to keep trading um, under the same management whereby they've reached an arrangement to pay off debts over a period of time where 75% of creditors, uh, that's all creditors, agree to the proposal. So if you have that situation where 75% of creditors, generally speaking, have, have agreed, the landlord is going to be bound by the terms and the process can be used to write off or minimise the rent that is outstanding that a landlord is entitled to recover and also to adjust the rent that's payable over a longer period of time. Often where you've got um, 
you know, national tenants that have uh, got many different landlords. Landlords can be treated differently. One may see its rights to recover curtailed severely. Others may get full recovery. Um, it depends on where, you know, the, the, the profitable stores are, are deemed to be situated. The landlord does retain its right to try and recover the lease for forfeiture, but only in respect of that revised rent that may well have been agreed. And um, I mean, the effect is that, yes, the landlord can be compelled to exist to percent, accept a percentage of the rent for years and, uh, and a lower rent going forward. Um, and it would have to go through a costly process of challenging any decision for on, on the grounds of some irregularity or because um, it's argued that it's, it's, it's unfairly prejudicial. But that's not an easy hurdle in the in the Devon's case. Several landlords tried that on on five different grounds and ultimately failed to get the CBA set aside. So um, it, it can leave um, landlords trapped in a vastly uh, different situation to, to that which was um, created by the terms of the lease, uh, with, with very limited options to, to try and get themselves out of that situation. I'm afraid to say. I mean it. It really paints a bit of a of a scary picture if you're a commercial property investor and uh, those commercial properties you know, you had uh, some nice um, some nice commercial property uh, advisors who told you well you know if if people don't pay the rent you've always got the asset you know the idea that you know, and a lot of uh, accounting uh, bods will tell you well on a on a on a lease we don't we don't bother uh, looking to impair or or put any money aside in the in the form of an IFRS nine provision, because we've always got the asset. You can't lose your principal. But it sounds to me actually like there is quite a, a potential for loss in this. Um, we're 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 cutting to the end, so uh, we, we're wrapping up in a moment. But before we do, Mark, all of that sounds like it could be can be pretty uncomfortable for local authorities. What what could be the you know very briefly what's what the what sort of impact on the bottom line could some of that some just some of the uh, some of those uh, I mean, concentrating on the CVA example for um, for, for the benefit of time, what um, what's the what could be the impact on a, on a local authority's bottom line of of a CVA? You know, what's interesting is, um, is that obviously you know most of these investments that local authorities are entering into are being funded through long term borrowing, and most of that's from the come from the public works loan board. So the public works loan board aren't going to be able, aren't going to renegotiate the interest on those loans if your income stream dries up. So you're going to be saddled with continuing to pay interest costs for a long time and won't have necessarily have an income to match those. You could try and repay the loans early, but as everyone on the call is hopefully aware, you know, repaying PWB loans is very, very expensive. So you have a premium to repay. And while you can amortise that over the life of the loan that you've repaid, you know, that's still an ongoing revenue cost that you need to consider and you won't have the income necessarily to, to match that. Obviously, you know, if you fund it from borrowing, you'd have to make MRP. Some local authorities have used innovative MRP profiles where they've linked MRP to income streams. And if your income stream falls, it's not necessarily going to be considered prudent to go back and recast the MRP and reduce that. So it would extend it. So again, you're going to continue to have to put money aside every year to repay their loans. Um, you're going to have to continue to pay the cost of ownership because you're not going to leave your asset to um, dilapidate you're going to continue to maintain it and heat and light it um, so there's still those on, ongoing costs but ultimately as you mentioned there you know the value the value could fall and it's quite mentioning the MHCLG guidance again it's quite clear in that document that if you invest in what they call as non-financial assets which pretty much covers commercial investment property, property investments if at any time the value falls below the debt that's outstanding you know you as a local authority you've got to make it quite clear in your strategy what your action is going to it's going to be and it might be that you will your your members force you to sell sell the asset and unfortunately we haven't got value on the call but the fair value of the of the asset will have a a link to the the tenant that's in there all the tenants that are in the asset and and the market that the asset operates in so it may be that you're left with an asset that's well below the, the outstanding value of the debt so you know, there's potential capital losses that may be also recognised. So ultimately, you know, as, as you mentioned, Stephen, it's quite a risky decision. There are a number of risks to consider and there are going to be some, you know, the, the yield that perhaps you were told at the outset by the um, estate agent and the glossy brochure that when you went to buy the asset, 
in, in these current these current uncertain times that yield is the gross yield but the net yield could be considerably stretched by those costs that you have to continue to pay yeah so a, uh, a possibly quite uh, quite scary note to, note to end on but hopefully obviously we hope that those things don't uh, don't come to pass but but if they do um there are obviously uh, limited things that that uh, local authorities can do to to protect themselves but really it's about making sure you're on the front foot and doing some of the the monitoring and doing and making and, and checking your legal documentation now before some of these things start to come to pass so i suppose that's the the big takeaway from the call um we've run over time so i'm going to call it a day now um but first of all just uh, to say thank you to everybody who's joined the call and to say thank you to mark and phil for joining us and giving us some great uh uh, great insight and uh, really demonstrating some some expertise there. Uh, next week we will be doing um, a short update on uh, economic uh, releases that will be coming out over the month um, and probably giving you a sort of the greatest hits of some of the other uh, webcasts that we've done through June and July but uh, I'll just say thank you to everybody again and say goodbye. <laughs>